So before I move on to Korean art, a few housekeeping items. I want to put in another plug for the video on The Great Leap Forward. I realize that this is a long chunk to recommend, but it's an incredibly important episode in modern history. So think about watching it, okay? For what it's worth, The Great Leap Forward will show up again in your summer reading for AP World History. And here's a follow-up to the video segment on socialist realism. I hope you had a chance to watch this earlier. If not, maybe you could watch it now. The poster on the left is an example of Soviet socialist realism. It was really communist Russia that inaugurated this art movement. The image on the right shows a Chinese worker reading Mao's little red book. And in fact, socialist realism influenced art in Europe and America as well. You've probably seen the We Can Do It poster before. It's sometimes called American realism, but I think you'll see the resemblance, including the dramatic use of what perspective technique to show depth foreshortening. Okay, let's climb into our time machines, punch in Korea, and travel back about 1,500 years. I know embarrassingly little about Korean history before the 19th century, although I know more than I did before I started preparing this lecture. This short clip from the Korean History Channel will give you some introduction to the kingdom that ruled large chunks of Korea for 900 years. It also gives you a good, quick look at Korean Buddhist art, which is missing from our required images even though it was Korea that exported Buddhism to Japan. You also hear an argument that the Koreans borrowed the golden ratio and improved on it, a reminder that many cultures have similar but subtly different canons of proportion. The Khan Academy essay on this work was especially informative, so I'm not going to repeat everything you just read, or I hope you just read. Instead, let's play Second Guess the College Board. Why do you think they included this work? How does it fit in with some of the College Board's favorite themes? Well, there's an interesting dispute over function. The crown was found in the royal tomb shown here, and the gold is so thin and so fragile that art historians initially thought it must have been used only as a burial ornament, that it simply wouldn't withstand regular wear. Certainly, this buried item provides still more evidence that many cultures anticipated a rich afterlife and wanted their ruling elite, at least, to be well equipped for it. We've seen this phenomenon before, right? Fragility notwithstanding, the crown may have had another function in addition to equipping Korean royalty for the afterlife. Let me read a passage from an Asian art textbook that I've been consulting as I prepared this lecture. The indigenous belief system developed by the ancient Koreans was a type of shamanism, resembling that practiced in Siberia. Korean shamanism also shares elements with Japanese Shinto, for example, the animistic worship of celestial phenomena such as mountains. And from a Korean studies blog, the structure of these elaborate crowns clearly depicts trees, antlers, and other facets of nature, all of which are items of great importance to the spiritual ideas of shamanism in Korea. These crowns also evoke the simpler but very similar designs of headdresses worn by shamans in what is now Siberia. I've put an example up on the slide. So some scholars propose that Shia kings took the role of a state shaman, an intermediary with the spirits on behalf of their people. Shamanism persists in Korea in a ceremony called the Gut, in which a shaman, often a woman, serves as an intercessor for people who want the help of the spirit world to invoke good fortune or to cure illnesses by exercising evil spirits. Sometimes such services are held to help guide the spirit of deceased person to heaven. I've included a photo of a mushang or shaman leading a gut. Note that there's some similarity between the headdresses. The crown includes three tree-shaped vertical elements that probably represent the sacred tree that once stood in the ritual precinct of Gyeongju. This sacred tree was conceived as a world tree, or an axis mundi, that connected heaven and earth. So, where have we encountered the axis mundi before? Well, here are a couple of examples. The Yasti on top of the stoop at Sanchi, and the Garbagri at the Lakshmana temple. Two additional antler-shaped protrusions may refer to reindeer that were native to the Eurasian steppe that lies to the north of the Korean peninsula, and those dangling gold discs and jade ornaments called gagak symbolize ripe fruits hanging from branches, that is, fertility and abundance. The Khan Academy essay included a photo of still another Central Asian crown, this one found at a nomad gravesite in Afghanistan. So we see further evidence of cultural sharing or borrowing. This work has it all. 
It adds another country to our list. Its function is intriguingly ambiguous. It references performance art and shamanism, both beloved of the College Board. It reflects cross-cultural exchange and shared influences between Central Asia and China. The early Korean and Chinese dynasties had similar burial customs. There's even a shout out to an artistic role for women. And of course, the crown is stunningly beautiful. I am not complaining about including this word in the list, not at all. But I have to poke fun at the College Board from time to time, right? In the 7th century, so just a little later than the crown we just examined, the Shia kingdom conquered Korea's other two kingdoms and formed an alliance and strong trading relationship with Tang Dynasty China. As we'll soon see, Japan went through a similar political development during the same period. Remember that the Tang Dynasty represented the height of Buddhism in China. Under the Shia rulers, Buddhism also became the dominant religion in Korea. So here are three versions of the guardian figures, or Niyo or Vajrapani, the historical Buddha's bodyguards. The one on the bottom is Korean, located in the 7th century temple, although the figures were created later. So do you remember where the other two were found? The one on the top left is from the Longman Caves in China, and the one on the top right is from the Todaiji Temple in Nara, Japan. By the way, when the Todaiji Temple was formally consecrated, Tang Dynasty's officials were in attendance, along with emissaries from Korea and Persia, and the blessing was said by a monk from India. The original Great Buddha at Todaiji was designed by a Korean artist. Globalization is not a new phenomenon in art. Strong ties with the Tang Dynasty also brought Confucianism to Korea. In 958, Korea adopted a civil service examination very similar to China's, likewise based on knowledge of Confucian texts. Buddhism, however, remained the Korean state religion. The Shia Kingdom disintegrated in the 9th century, partly because its ally, the Chinese Tang Dynasty, was also falling apart and so couldn't provide military assistance. But a new dynasty took charge, and when China revived under the Song Dynasty, so did the Chinese-Korean ties. Also like China, Korea was conquered by the Mongols and was in fact ruled by the Chinese-Mongol Yuan Dynasty for close to 100 years. In 1392, another Korean dynasty, the Chosun, took power and ruled into the 20th century. This dynasty formed strong ties with the Chinese dynasty ruling at the time, which was the Ming. Ming rulers actually helped the Koreans repel an invasion from Japan. This portrait dates from the Chosun dynasty and shows the influence of Neo-Confucianism. Korean elites were very enthusiastic practitioners of Chinese painting, poetry, and music, or to use a term you learned in one of my earlier lectures, they were literati. The portrait on the right is in fact a Ming dynasty portrait of a high Chinese official from about the same period. So what common features do you see? They're both seated in full-length view. They're both dressed in official robes with official black silk hats. These are government-sponsored portraits. They both include a rank badge as embroidered insignia on their robes. The Khan Academy notes that while the Korean portrait followed Neo-Confucian conventions, the facial features were painted with the goal of transmitting a sense of unique physical likenesses. According to our experts, this careful attention to the sitter's face such as wrinkles and bone structure, served the Korean belief that the face could reveal important clues about the subject. So is this the only true of Korean court portraits? I wondered and started geeking out, looking at websites that showed Ming Dynasty Chinese portraits. I put one of these sites on this slide and it's up on Moodle. So here's the Ming Dynasty bureaucrat's face, along with another one I found on this website. What do you think? I think it would be very hard for me, at least, to tell the difference between Korean and Chinese court portraits of the same era, and I don't think you'll be asked to. And anyway, here are three more Korean portraits. If you're wondering about the one on the right, according to the gallery website where I found it, the Korean artist has opened up a new chapter in Oriental painting through a special melding of traditional Korean portrait techniques and mass cultural popular icons. I'm amazed the college born missed that one. By the way, official portraits live on. My husband needed to have his portrait painted for the courthouse of the Tenth Circuit in Denver. He served as a judge before returning to academia. An artist came out to our cabin for a couple of days to make preliminary sketches, and here's one of them. The artist suggested the painting should include the most beautiful member of our family. As you'll see, our husband agreed. My husband agreed. <laughs> 
Before we leave Korea, let me just remind you about the global contemporary work on the left, another work that shows the strong connection between Chinese and Korean artistic culture. By the way, in my previous lecture, you saw this work upside down. Oops. Ms. Jacobs caught my mistake, and I fixed it in this slide and in your second semester workbooks. I'm going to pause here again to spare YouTube too rich a diet of images. In my final lectures, I will move on to Japan.